Well, thanks a lot for inviting me, and thanks for coming out. It's kind of a chilly evening, but uh, it's nice to meet you all here. Uh, since we recently observed Remembrance Day, I thought it might be appropriate for us to spend some time here tonight thinking about the situation of animals in war and uh, to think about what they've suffered in those situations. Uh, of course, in terms of sheer numbers, nothing can really compare to the uh, deliberate savagery that we've inflicted on uh, other animals as we use them for food, clothing, entertainment, objects of experimentation, and so on. But uh, nevertheless, the uh, suffering that has been inflicted on animals as collateral damage in war still remains pretty impressive. Uh, and that suffering has been shaped by ideologies of human exceptionalism, of speciesism, and uh, dominionism, and processes of commodification. And all of these have produced the othering of non-human animals. And the uh, dualistic thinking that characterizes patriarchal uh, attitudes towards nature has uh, devalued animals and has allowed us to treat other animals as mere things. Uh, things to be used. Uh, obviously, we know that they are not, like this little fellow here <laughs> wandering around. Glad he came out as well. Um, and this attitude towards animals, uh, this use of them, is just as evident in war as it is in our other everyday uses of non-human animals. Uh, in all of these contexts, we have regarded non-human animals as the means uh, for us to obtain our own objectives. Uh, human ingenuity seems limitless in the ways in which we have conscripted other animals to meet our own objectives, giving little thought to theirs. Throughout history, we've forced other animals to serve us in our violent pursuits, and to help us achieve ever greater feats of destruction. For thousands of years, humans have considered it their right to enslave other animals, uh, forcing them into war, using them to haul equipment, supplies, uh, and soldiers into battle. For example, uh, elephants have long been used in warfare to attack and frighten enemies. Uh, armored elephants carrying archers on their backs were used to drive through enemy defenses and fortifications. Uh, the use of, animal, or of elephants in war is uh, well known from ancient empires, uh, India, Sri Lanka, Burma, Thailand, uh, Cambodia, Persia many others. And in some of these cases, thousands of elephants were mobilized in war. Um, and doubtless, those uh, experiences, those battles must have been uh, almost as terrifying for uh, uh, their human targets as for the elephants. But um, human armies developed ways to resist these weapons of war, uh, such attacks, which of course usually involve deadly, uh, deadly violence towards the animals, hmm, directed at them specifically. Hmm. Nevertheless, uh, the use of elephants in battles continued into the 19th century in Asia, and uh, because they, can't, they can go where mechanized vehicles can't, uh, they were still used to carry supplies and uh, also used in uh, military construction and so on in 20th century wars. And of course, to be put to such uses, often elephants were captured in the wild, uh, uh, which often involved abducting uh, young animals uh, after killing the older members of their family who tried to protect them. Uh, and then the captives are uh, then subjected to 
brutal training methods to subdue them and to make them obey commands. Well, prior to the development of mechanized transport, animals were essential to war. Without them, humans could engage in limited local skirmishes, but for more extensive campaigns of destruction, uh, animals were necessary to carry soldiers and food and equipment. Using these large, powerful animals allowed armies to have greater uh, speed and mobility and allowed, allowed them to have more sophisticated ways of killing each other. And indeed, throughout history, without the forced conscription of these other animals, it would have been impossible for us to carry out wars as we've known them. And as I said, our imagination seems to have almost no limit when it comes to how we've exploited animals during wartime. Uh, some of the, uh, sometimes this is done in, in rather surprising ways. For example, in the First World War, soldiers would carry, uh, would capture jars full of glowworms and use their, the light of their bodies, their bioluminescence, uh, to read maps in the trenches and so on. In both the First and Second World Wars, uh, the British alone used hundreds of thousands of pigeons to carry messages. So animals we wouldn't really think of as being involved in, in military conflict. But, but in fact, throughout history, we've used a wide variety of animals in war. But let's just focus here now uh, on horses as an example. Horses are actually among the most widely used animals in war. Uh, and almost as soon as humans domesticated horses, they recognized the utility of these animals uh, in helping them to kill their enemies. So we see horse-drawn chariots uh, used in ancient empires such as Assyria, Babylon, Egypt, Alexander the Great, uh, using uh, horses, cavalry to uh, conquer uh, uh, Persia and northern India, uh, China, deployed thousands of, of mounted soldiers, um, adapting the uh, techniques of the nomadic armies that they had encountered. Uh, in the 13th century, the Mongol armies used horses to outmaneuver European troops. And horses used a, or played a vital role in uh, allowing a small number of Spanish soldiers to overthrow the Aztec and Inca empires in, uh, in the Americas. Well, the high point of Europe's cavalry came in the 16th century. After that, with the development of gunpowder weapons, infantry became more uh, important. Infantry was cheaper to maintain. There's always a lot of uh, soldiers that could be uh, put in place. Uh, it was more expensive to maintain heavily armored cavalry and, uh, and trained riders. And indeed, cavalry and the mounted warrior have been uh, markers of elite status in the military, largely because it's expensive to breed and maintain horses. Um, so although the role of infantry expanded after the 16th century, uh, cavalry still remained important in Europe uh, into the 19th century. Uh, cavalry useful not only for killing uh, uh, enemy soldiers, but also for quelling political dissent at home. For example, the Peterloo massacre in Manchester in 1819, when uh, citizens mobilized calling for parliamentary reform, that was put down by uh, mounted troops. And of course, we see police on horseback at demonstrations today. Uh, the European military continued to use horses into the 20th century. And in fact, 
all of the warring nations entered the First World War uh, with large supplies of draft animals and cavalry units. Even though it should have been clear at the outset of that war that there had been a transformation in military affairs that had now made cavalry obsolete. There had been signs of this already. A clear indication of this, for example, was uh, in 1854, the famous charge of the Light Brigade in the Crimean War. That gave a striking uh, indication that the days of cavalry had passed as British mounted troops charged into Russian artillery and were torn to shreds. Nevertheless, despite such clear signs, both Britain and Germany actually increased uh, uh, and built up their cavalry forces before World War I. And some mounted charges did take place in World War I, but new killing technologies, uh, uh, trench warfare, barbed wire, meant disaster for those who persisted with these now outmoded tactics. So the use of cavalry quickly declined after World War I, in World War I, but horses still played an important role as draft animals uh, because mechanized vehicles couldn't operate in these vast fields of mud. So military commanders found it essential to use horses. Although we don't know for certain how many horses died in World War I, it's evident that huge numbers of animals suffered unimaginable torments. Many of them died before they even reached the battlefield. Uh, after all, they were rounded up quickly for military service. Many of them died from harsh treatment and injuries. Uh, sometimes horses were in transit for several weeks, shipped in tightly packed, filthy conditions, deprived of food and water. Many of them died of disease or exposure. And then, after they reached the battlefield, it was difficult to supply them with food or shelter. And then these animals were subjected to grueling labor under harsh conditions. Many of them worked to death. Others trapped in the mud and drowned or were shot. These horses faced all of the same dangers that human soldiers did. Landmines, artillery attacks, sniper fire, poison gas, and so on. But they also faced additional risks. Each side knew that horses were vital to the military operations of their enemies. And indeed, they knew that horses were far more important than common soldiers. There was a lot of those. Therefore, they deliberately targeted their opponent's animals in order to reduce their mobility. As a consequence of all of this, the life expectancy of horses in the battlefield was drastically uh, shortened. It's difficult for us to imagine what they endured in these situations. Many soldiers have described the nightmarish conditions that they had to endure in warfare. Uh, it must have been even worse for the animals. After all, horses are sensitive animals. They're known for their flight reflex. And in combat, the noise, the smells, the explosions, the screaming, uh, all of this must have been indescribably frightening for these animals. Um, obviously, humans suffered greatly in these conditions, but they could at least understand what was going on around them. Uh, and some of them, some of the soldiers were able to console themselves with thoughts of patriotism, heroism, glory, sacrifice for their nation. Horses had no such consolations. But 
prevented from escaping, simply had to endure these incomprehensible terrors inflicted upon them. As more animals were killed, their importance to the war machine became all the more apparent, and military forces tried to replace them. So horses, like men, were conscripted for the military. And while they had long been considered property, war intensified the commodification of animals and created higher prices for them, because they were valuable. In World War I, the demand for horses led to serious shortages uh, in significant peacetime activities like agriculture, transportation. And as domestic supplies of horses were depleted in Europe, the European militaries began turning to other countries to get supplies, Argentina, Australia, North America. So warfare begins then to shape the contours of an international market in horses. And uh, also uh, creates uh, new policies. The Department of War and the Department of Agriculture in Britain uh, create new policies, uh, new legislation to uh, uh, increase the supply of horses and improve breeding. Governments set up networks of breeding stations and selective breeding policies intended to produce the types of horses that the military wanted. And those breeding programs were considered an essential part of national defense. So as the, uh, this huge military market expands into an international industry, the breeding, the selling, the transporting, the training of horses all become major businesses, although the motives of the people involved in these businesses often clashed. Mm -hmm. Governments, farmers, breeders, dealers, they're all competing for horses. Farmers saw the military as a way to get rid of horses that they didn't really want, make some money out of it. Breeders and dealers saw their chance to make huge profits from horses, but they complained that the government wasn't paying them enough or they, they were too selective about the types of horses that they were going to, to buy. Uh, and of course, the military's uh, uh, demand for specific types of horses also had an impact on uh, on the horses themselves as uh, over generations uh, you know, breeding uh, breeding shaped uh, you know shaped them physically and horses who did not meet these military specifications uh, were considered useless and as demand intensified, and as breeders scramble to profit from this, they create the problem of an excess of unwanted, unsuitable uh, horses, especially by the end of the war. Well, now what are we going to do with all these animals? Well, they solve this by promoting the slaughterhouse industry and advertising campaigns that praise the tastiness of horse flesh. Uh, and the government promotion of the horse breeding industry also played a role in uh, building up the uh, growth of the recreational equestrian industry, which also has negative consequences for unwanted horses. Well, although horses were rounded up by the millions, uh, they were essential to the war effort, rounded up in huge numbers, uh, at the end of the conflict, the survivors were considered a burden. Uh, although we may now, in some small measure, acknowledge the vital role that horses played in the war, and military propaganda sometimes valorizes the idea that these animals, too, engaged in a sacrifice of their own interests for the nation. It was abundantly clear that the military regarded them as even more expendable and disposable than human soldiers. <laughs>
the British Army did ship some horses to India after the war for further military service there. Uh, but many animals who survived the war, especially the ones that were in poor health, were simply shot or sold to the slaughterhouses in Europe. Although the U.S. sold millions of horses to European militaries and then used millions more themselves when they entered the war, only 200 horses were shipped back to the United States after the war ended. So we might think after uh, the end of World War I, uh, animals now were completely uh, replaced by mechanized vehicles. But in fact, animals continued to play uh, an important role in the military. In the Second World War, again, huge numbers of horses forced to work for the military, especially in Germany and Russia, each of which used millions of horses. Germany especially suffered from uh, lack of oil, so they used horses extensively to uh, transport supplies and uh, maneuver their artillery around and so on. And even in the Second World War, there were some military attacks that did use horses. And this continues into the 21st century. In Afghanistan, U.S. Special Forces using horses to conduct operations in, in Afghanistan after 2000, or, uh, yeah, 2001. Or another example in Sudan, the Janjaweed militia, sometimes described as devils on horseback, uh, attacking on horses or camels, attacking thousands of people amidst charges of genocide in that country. Well, although horses are no longer used uh, extensively in this way in the military, they're still used in other important ways for ceremonial purposes by armies of various nations, serving in a military parade and so on, as a means to express a statement about power. So horses still have a lot of symbolic significance for military forces. Of course, the very act of riding a horse confers a message of domination and power over the natural world. The horse, after all, must be broken in order to be ridden. And the horse is widely seen as a symbol of nobility and uh, power. Riding a horse sends a message that one has usurped these qualities from the animal and somehow through some magical process absorbed them, these powers into oneself. So this image, uh, the powerful man on horseback, is a, an important theme in war memorials, as if to suggest that rather than being squalid and savage, war is somehow some sort of noble endeavor. So typically, the military uses animals uh, in a symbolic way to create these pro-military sentiments. For example, in 2006, during Veterans Week in Canada, uh, the Veteran Affairs Department uh, produced a web page for children called Tales of Animals in War. The website portrays happy-looking cartoon animals and features stories about the brave sacrifices made by these various animals used by the Canadian Armed Forces. The stories of the animals are ostensibly written by their relatives, their animal relatives, um, and presumably this is a way of attracting children to the military and instilling patriotic feelings in them. And it also creates this idea that animals somehow willingly participate in human warfare. So here we have another means of manufacturing consent in war pro propaganda, using animals to speak for the legitimacy of war. Well, in recent years, there has been some small acknowledgement, recognition that 
animal's own experiences in war uh, should be considered, acknowledged. Uh, for example, in 2004, the Animals in War Monument outside Hyde Park in London, created by the sculptor uh, David Backhouse. The monument features uh, two life-size bronze uh, donkeys or mules uh, carrying supplies, as well as statues of a horse and a dog, and then relief carvings of a number of other animals that have been used in war, camels, elephants, birds, uh, and so on. Mm -hmm. It's quite a moving memorial. Mm -hmm. uh, the inscription on that memorial reads, this monument is dedicated to all the animals that served and died alongside British and Allied forces in wars and campaigns throughout time. They had no choice. Well, that monument was very controversial. Uh, the mainstream animal studies scholar, Jonathan Burt in England, objected to it. Can't have this. He wrote that the inscription on the monument, they had no choice, is wholly inappropriate to describe the situation of animals in war because, as he says, Choice, with its all-too-human connotations of individualism and consumption, is not a word one would use for animals, even when they act freely. And it raises disconcerting questions about whether some beings are more deserving of sympathy than others. He wasn't the only one who was disturbed by the monument. The journalist uh, George Monbiot, who writes for The Guardian, often on environmental issues, kind of a liberal, um, also objected to the memorial. He called it the Disneyfication of war. And he argued that this monument to animals trivialized the suffering uh, that happens in war by establishing what he called the cult of the heroic animal. And he says... The emphasis given to animals suffering in war suggests a failure to acknowledge the suffering of human beings. He doesn't explain how this happens. Um, the tableau in Park Lane carries the justifying motto, they had no choice. Nor did the civilians killed in Iraq, the millions of women raped over the centuries by soldiers, or the colonial subjects who died of famine or disease in British concentration camps. Well, that's all true. But, of course, this doesn't mean that we should dismiss the suffering of animals. Concern for one group of victims doesn't mean that we should exclude our compassion for the suffering of another group. What is the sense in that? Um, Monbiot's uh, contempt for compassion for animals is probably unsurprising given his opposition to animal rights uh, and his published attacks on veganism and his failure to see that as anything other than a fad diet uh, rather than to recognize it for what it is, a progressive uh, philosophy that rejects violence and exploitation. But both Bert and Monbiot are surely wrong in their complaints. Animals are individuals, I'm sure you know this, uh, and choice is not something that is limited simply to consumerist decisions, as uh, Bert seems to suggest in his quotation there. Um, furthermore, Recent findings in cognitive ethology, the interesting work that's been done by Mark Beckoff, Jonathan Balcom, uh, Jeffrey Masson, many others, really interesting findings about the uh, abilities, the interior life, the complex emotions of animals. Um, 
all of these findings suggest that Bert's view of the uh, capacities of animals is simply, well, wrong, much too limited. Hmm? Um, he doesn't clarify why he thinks that animals do not make choices when they act freely. What else are they doing <laughs> but making choices? Hmm? Um, but it is certain that the animals commemorated in the memorial were forced into war, which is the obvious meaning behind the statement that they had no choice. Of course, it is indeed the case that many humans, especially those who are poor and powerless, are also victimized by war. But many others, eager to kill for excitement or glory or loot, willingly participate in war, or they fail to resist it. And I think that Bert's misplaced alarm that the monument might suggest that, as he says, some beings are more deserving of sympathy than others, seems to reflect his anxiety that other animals suffering might be given anything like the sympathy that we at least claim to express for humans uh, killed in war. And Monbiot is correct in observing that British memorials overlook civilians victimized in war. But he too seems outraged that any recognition of the suffering of animals uh, is mentioned unless every last human victim is counted up beforehand, as if we only have a certain amount of sympathy and compassion. Uh, and, and, we, and we have to measure this out mm, on a scale of more or less worthy victims. Mm. Of course, the lines of species, uh, you know, defining these, uh, the worthiness of the victims. Mm. And in fact, these complaints seem to be simply another version of the standard speciesist complaint, which I'm sure that you have all heard, used to delegitimize animal advocacy. You care more about animals than you do about people. Delivered as if to suggest that these should be mutually exclusive. Well, of course, the objective of such statements is to maintain that sharp distinction between humans and animals. Uh, whereas, in fact, the monument's inscription quite accurately captures the fact that humans, uh, that animals have always been forced to serve in human wars. And indeed, that they are worthy not only of our profound sympathy for their plight, but also our efforts to relieve them. Well, as I said, for thousands of years, animals have been used as vehicles of war, transporting soldiers, material, equipment, food, so on, to build infrastructure, so on. But they've been vehicles of war in more than just this literal sense, and this continues today. Although the mechanization of war and the sophisticated technology that allows long-distance killing uh, you know, you don't even have to see your victims. They're, you know, just something on a screen somewhere or else you're miles above them. Uh, this has reduced our dependence on other animals for transportation and labor, but we're still using them in ways to achieve our violent objectives. We use animals to test our weapons, to develop new methods of killing other humans, and to harden ourselves for murder. The U.S. military uses hundreds of thousands of animals every year in its medical training programs, subjecting them to gunshot wounds, stabbings, burns, radiation, poisoning, things we can't imagine people doing deliberately to, to animals. Um, and although these experiments clearly cause terrible suffering, the military typically doesn't give them uh, medication to alleviate their pain. 
Military research also involves the development of biological weapons. So thousands of animals are deliberately infected with parasites, diseases, a wide range of deadly viruses. And uh, in addition to those forms of direct physical abuse, other experiments going on, sleep deprivation studies, uh, exposure to excessive noise, hypothermia. And again, in, in all of these experiments, animals are victimized in order so that we can perfect more effective ways of killing each other. Although, of course, the military always defends these procedures on the grounds of defense. Uh, it's clear that the military is interested in developing more effective weapons, many of which will be used against civilians. For example, 2003, the American Anti-Vivisection Society reported that the uh, U.S. Naval Board was using uh, uh, animals to test uh, pulsed energy projectiles. And the goal of those experiments was to determine uh, how effective such weapons were in causing excruciating pain and temporary paralysis. And the uh, society, American Anti-Vivisection Society, uh, reported that these weapons were being used for, uh, developed for crowd control. Well, despite all of the rhetoric from the vivisection industry about its dedication to finding alternatives, animal testing, including military research, is increasing. In 2006, the independent British newspaper reported that British military testing on animals had doubled in the previous five years. 2011, the Daily Mail reported a huge rise in vivisection with millions of experiments per year uh, being conducted on animals in the UK. And just as with corporate vivisection, many of these military experiments are not only barbaric, but they're redundant because they repeat what other people have already been doing you know, down the street. And tens of thousands of animals are being subjected to horrifying suffering in biological and chemical warfare experiments. As The Independent reported, monkeys in secret military labs exposed to anthrax, pigs have 40% of their blood drained and injected with E. coli, uh, others exposed to poison gas and lethal nerve agents, and also pigs being shot to uh, develop body armor. Um, the British Union for the Abolition of Vivisection said the experiments involved uh, chemical-induced burns, poison gas experiments, applying fatal doses of nerve agents to animal skins, monkeys be being dosed with sarin and anthrax, and uh, uh, that group, the BUAV, demanded that the details of these experiments be made public. Of course, the government and the military refused to, to do that. Not very surprising. Other animal experiments have been useful to the military in terms of psychological warfare and torture. For example, the psychologist Martin Seligman, notorious for his savage experiments in the 1960s with dogs, he psychologically destroyed caged dogs by repeatedly subjecting them to electric shocks with no hope of escape. The dogs were reduced to a condition that Seligman called learned helplessness, his big you know, achievement. And the dogs wouldn't try to escape even when the cage door was left open because they had been destroyed by these processes. Procedure. Under the Bush II presidency, Selig Seligman's research proved attractive for the CIA and for uh, military interrogators and, uh, in the torturing of prisoners in the so-called War on Terror. Uh, 
uh, Seligman denied that he condoned torture. Well, <laughs> there's an obvious contradiction there. He's been torturing dogs. That's his career um, by you know creating learned helplessness. But he denied that he condoned torture. Uh, yet he was involved in a program uh, to train. U.S. soldiers to resist torture. It was called survival, evasion, resistance, and escape. And he then joined a group of other psychologists who agreed uh, to reverse engineer these tactics uh, and training methods into interrogation techniques. Well, in addition to using animals to develop new weapons and to help soldiers carry out their mission. The military also uses animals to develop a warlike state of mind. Uh, by encouraging cruelty to animals, the military can produce more efficient killers who feel less compunction about attacking other humans. For example, in 2002, the World Society for the Protection of Animals uh, released some videos of so-called bravery tests that were given to Peruvian army cadets. The videos showed dogs tied up between two poles, unable to move. Each cadet would then rush forward and stab the dogs, sometimes repeatedly. Uh, and the Sunday Times reported on these videos, uh, quoting them, once the animal is dead, its flesh is ripped apart, and the soldiers pull out its heart and drink its blood. Finally, one of the soldiers is selected to perform a lap of honor around the training ground with the lifeless animal draped around his neck like a medal. And the Times noted that the objective of this grotesque exercise was to transform humans into ruthless killing machines who relish the sight of blood. Well, these squalid scenes provide a clear example of how violence to non-human animals is used to drive humans into complete depravity. And as well as using direct attacks on other animals as a means to do this and to make humans more violent, the military mentality itself is created through the symbolic use of animals to encourage soldiers to kill people. It's very useful to first dehumanize or animalize the enemy. Just as racist discourse consistently uses animal imagery, uh, we see demeaning images of animals used in the military, where we, of course, also find a lot of racist discourse. Enemies are described as dogs, vermin, pigs, lice, rats, monkeys, in order to create hatred towards them and to conceptualize them as beings who are unworthy of any ethical consideration, just as we assert that animals do not such deserve such consideration. So here we clearly see the devaluation of nature, not only this, but also that ideologies of speciesism and dominionism also have negative effects on humans as well as other animals. Uh, the devaluation of other forms of life, the creation of hierarchies, is an open invitation to move humans into these inferior categories and then to treat them accordingly. So. Our assertion that non-human animals exist only as property has allowed us to exploit them in countless ways. Uh, the ideologies of speciesism and militarism have allowed us to transform animals into our vehicles of war. And under our assumed right to do whatever we want with them, we've consigned uncounted millions of animals to terror without end uh, as we use them to uh, improve our chances of 
of killing other humans. Well, coming to the end, uh, recently, and to a small degree, we've started to acknowledge their suffering and our wars through these public memorials, which recognize that they had no choice. However, as is the case with our recognition of the horrors endured by humans in war, it's important not to stop with remembrance and memorials, but to try to prevent violence. And it's only through a combined anti-militaristic, anti-speciesist stance, one that's informed by an animal rights philosophy, takes that seriously, it's only through this approach that we uh, can prevent such suffering in the future. So I think I'll stop there. <laughs> Probably had enough. <laughs> so, thanks.